Welcome to a Prevent Connect podcast, where we explore the prevention of violence against women. This is a project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault. My name is Wendy White, and I'm with Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. I'm the violence prevention specialist, um, but I'm going to take the suggestion of one of our plenary speakers yesterday, uh, Amita uh, Sabadin, that I show up in the room um, not just professionally, but also personally. And I just want you to know that it wasn't easy for me to come here today uh, because my 16-year-old son lost his best friend last week, and he took his life. And I really, really thought I wouldn't come for quite a bit after the news. But then I decided I was getting on the plane. And I decided I was getting on the plane for a couple of reasons. One, I wanted to honor the beautiful and precious friendship those two boys have had since they were children. Secondly, I know that sexual violence and suicide are conjoined issues. And I hope that what I have to offer to you today will be useful in the work that you do. Because I believe our work is really ultimately about saving lives. And um, my son's friend's life was beautiful and precious as all young people's lives are. And so I'm here to honor him and to um, commend every one of you for being part of this work. Professionally, as the Interpersonal Violence Prevention Coordinator, I've been at Old Dominion University for six years practicing prevention. And in those six years, I have come to the realization that a systems approach to prevention is the most effective and most fundamental way to approach this issue. I do that through campus-wide strategies. We have campaigns on our campus. They all echo and reinforce a system-wide mes message about preventing violence and its importance. It sets the norms and the values on campus. All our educational programming supports and reinforces and echoes those norms as well. And because it is all so integrated, a culture shift is happening on our campus that we want to share with you today. And whatever the program, whatever the event, whatever the um, aspect of the campaigning that we're doing on our campus is, um, we are always developing active citizenship and leadership in our work. That's key to a systems approach. And it's key to prevention because we all know that when groups are marginalized, oppressed, victimized, when there's an unequal power relationship between groups, that sets the stage for violence. So gender equality, racial equality, ending homophobia, Islamophobia, ableism, all of those ism isms, addressing those through a system-wide approach reduces violence on campus. But I wasn't obviously always a preventionist. Um, before, actually in the 1990s when I started my career, I was a community organizer. I did my first organizing work on the North Shore of Massachusetts with the immigrants from the Dominican Republic um, that lived there and we organi organized around issues of lead paint in the buildings where they lived, um, access to healthcare, things like that. And then I was recruited to the great state of Texas. And I came to Texas in the mid-90s, and I worked first right here in Dallas, so it's a big full circle for me. Um, I worked for an organization called Dallas Area Interfaith, which still exists today. It's a coalition of 60 congregations, or it was at the time, 60 congregations and churches that have made great positive strides here in Dallas. And then I went down to Austin working for Austin Area Interfaith, a similar um, coalition of churches and schools um, working in communities uh, around issues of um, education, economic um, and environmental justice. And um, all of this uh, happened oftentimes with marginalized and underrepresented communities. And so when I got to 
my seat at Old Dominion University and started practicing prevention, I realized I was still doing community organizing work. I was just doing it in a different setting. And so that's what we're going to share today. I'm going to uh, pass it to my colleague, Luanza Lett Brewington, and she can introduce herself. All right. Good morning, everyone. All right, y'all awake? Yeah? All right. So I come to you being raised in Arizona and Florida and having lived about 20 years in Massachusetts. So I say that to say you're going to hear a mix of y'all and fixin'. And then you're also going to hear Park the Car and a little bit of Wicked and then Cool. And sometimes you'll hear maybe some Dude and so forth. So all of that's going to be intertwined. And sometimes that throws a little bit of folks and they're, they're too busy trying to figure out, like, where the heck is this person coming from? <laughs> yes, I'm from all of those places. So it'll be OK. Don't, don't worry about it. I, I am from all of those places. So yeah. So that, that's, that's, we'll put that out there. So happy to be here. I'm the director of the Women's Center for, at Old Dominion and love working with Wendy there. We do lots of leadership and empowerment um, work there. Um, also, I've been working with both um, single and dual um, agencies that did sexual assault and domestic violence work. Um, so I understand that. I've been a, a shelter director, so have, have done that particular work as well and have done consulting work with um, private and nonprofit organizations doing strategic and organizational development work as well. But say all of that, at the heart, I'm a community organizer and love doing community organizing. And I firmly believe that people are at the core and the heart of the work that we do and believe that this is not just women's work. It's not just our agency's work. It's not just sexual assault agency work or domestic violence agency work or dual agency work or university work. It is our collective work that we do together that's going to make a difference. And it is my honor to be able to work with you all today to figure out how we can work on this together. So thank you for being here today. All right, here we go. So why a systems approach? Well. Systems analysis is extremely effective when you have a persistent and complex problem. This is a graph from the Rape and Incest National Network, RAIN, um, that shows the prevalence of sexual assault in our country over the last 25 years. And it starts in 1993, where 4.3% 4.3 assaults occurred per 1,000 people. And it goes up to 2015, and it's 1.6 assaults per 1,000 people in 2015. So that's a trend line that is definitely going in the right direction. But what's really um, useful to our conversation here today is if you look at the last decade, it's plateaued, right? We've gone down, and then we've just sort of gone straight. That's a persistent problem. And I knew that there was a, a persistent problem that I was facing as soon as I started doing this work six years ago and sitting in my seat. I felt it in my gut. I was an undergraduate 25 years earlier, and despite a quarter century since of raising awareness, breaking the silence, sharing statistics, and taking back the night, I organized a Take Back the Night event on my college campus 30 years ago. So despite 30 years of taking back the night, not only do the statistics show this, I still had a steady stream of students coming into my office to disclose and to seek services after experiencing violence. And I absolutely reeled with the realization that not enough had happened to end this epidemic. I knew we had to do something different. What we had been doing was necessary, but it wasn't sufficient if we were going to drive the numbers down below where they'd plateaued. Right. And so we all began this week, or th this conference, listening to two phenomenal speakers, Dr. Hooker and Amita Swadin. And they talked about how different groups of people experience sexual violence differently. Now, remember they were talking about, well, we know the fact that women experience sexual violence at a higher rate than men. We know that. But we also heard that students with disabilities are victimized at twice the rate of students without disabilities, okay? One in four queer or gender nonconforming students are sexually assaulted at a higher rate. 
Um, one in four Native American students are assaulted at a higher rate. We heard about African American women are assaulted at a higher rate. Here's another statistic that I know I was exci uh, excited to learn about because we were on a college campus that 40% of study abroad students report unwanted sexual contact. That's high and something that I know for us on a college campus that we're working to, to, to address all the time. So what that means is that depending upon someone's identity, accessing support services and reporting assault is a serious matter because they may or may not report. So this is a complex issue that we need to address because we are the people that they may report or not report to. Now, Amita talked about a trans individual. Let's look at that. If someone is a trans individual, let's say they are a trans individual who happens to be an African-American woman. Depending upon where she lives, if she's sexually assaulted, is she gonna go to the police? Maybe not, because going to the police, not only is she gonna be thinking about it, are they gonna believe me just because I got assaulted, but are they gonna believe me because I'm a trans black woman who got assaulted? Okay, first of all, are they gonna believe that I'm a woman? Are they gonna believe me because I'm trans and I'm a black woman because I'm hyposexualized, et cetera, et cetera? So this complex issue is a serious thing that we have to consider, right? In your area, what are some of the complex issues that, that you may encounter that individuals are considering in, in their areas? What are some con different drug facilitated assault? Drug -facilitated assault? Mm -hmm. Like like roofies that, that may be in, in different bars or so forth? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Immigrant refugees. Yeah. Immigrant and refugees. Yes. That's it's huge. Small town, everybody knows about it. So yeah, you may in a small town you may not want to go because the, the police may know the person and they may not believe you because, well, I know that person and they don't look like they could hurt you. That's a big thing. Or I know that person and they, they, they couldn't because I know that person. Yeah, over here. Uh, mental health. Mm -hmm. Mental health, yeah, exactly. They, they, they question your stability or that other person's stability or not. Or your credibility. Or your credibility, exactly. One more. Over here. Oh, sorry. Access to lack of accessibility. 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 Lack of interpreters and other kinds of areas of accessibility. Exactly. Thank you. Exactly. Because not everybody has interpreters that are that are going to be accessible at all or available. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. So what we recognize is that we, as administrators, that we are responsible for all of this, thinking about all of this and making sure that possibly that it's in place ahead of time because it's imperative for this risk assessment that we look at the, the complex problems that produce this reality that's on this grid here. And that sexual violence persists because of the cost and the change that sometimes seems too high and the, um, the systems benefit keeping the status quo, because a lot of times folks are like, who am I to be able to change this? But we as organizers recognize that it is our responsibility to at least think about making some changes. So I wanted to think about making changes. And when I don't know what to do, I'm a reader, so I go to a book. Um, and I also consulted my, my experience as an organizer. But um, this book was particularly helpful in, in helping me uh, start a systems analysis of our university. And it's called Systems Thinking for Social Change. We'll have it up on the screen in a little bit. And it's by David Peter Stroh, and it's a really practical guide that'll walk you through the process of taking a community or a campus or a base and doing this kind of methodical analysis of what is keeping the status quo in place, who is benefiting, why, and what might be a way to move you off of the square you're stuck on. So what does systems analysis reveal when you, you start looking at it? 
it reveals some really important things that our, our keynotes, our speakers yesterday talked about, how you may be contributing to the very problem you are trying to solve. This is one of the hardest first things you have to do when you're doing a systems analysis. You have to ask your questions like, what role are we playing in perpetuating this situation? My example from our work is that when um, students come to us who've experienced dating or domestic violence, we have lots of non-traditional aged students as well as traditional aged, um, we often refer them to shelters or we put them in safe, uh, safe housing on campus. And while that is certainly an important thing to do if they're um, imminently threatened, it also removes them from all their supports in their life. They may no longer have access to the transportation they need to get to their job to pay for their education. Their children, if they're moved into a shelter, may not be able to go to school. Certainly their friends and their family are further away. And all of that can make it very hard for a um, victim to successfully leave their abuser. So you're contributing to perhaps having them return to the situation that you were trying to get them out of. It also takes the focus away from the perpetrator. Not to say that supporting victims isn't important, but if all we're doing is building shelters and not looking at why people are perpetrating or how we can step in and prevent harm before it happens, then we're not looking at the whole equation. The other thing that systems analysis can help us do is look at perverse incentives. Now, my favorite example of perverse incentives these, day, these days comes from living in Hampton Roads in coastal Virginia. I don't know if y'all are aware, but we are perhaps one of the most vulnerable places to sea level ride, rise in the world. Since 1930, the sea level where we live, and we are right at sea level, it is as flat as Dallas, Texas, where we live. It has risen 14.3 inches since 1930. The very conservative projections right now is that the seas will rise seven to eight feet by the end of this century. That means my neighborhood where I live is going to be gone, and a lot of the university that we work at is going to be gone. So the perverse incentive there is the um, federally funded flood insurance program, because um, we have a storm, or we even have really a very strong onshore wind, and that brings the sea, le sea into the community and streets flood on a blue sky day. We call it blue sky flooding. Houses are damaged. damaged. They need to be rebuilt or repaired, and the federal flood insurance program does that, puts them right back, right in the line of harm one more time. So we're not planning on how are we going to move people away from the most vulnerable areas in their community? How are we gonna help them if they lose all their assets at some point? The federal in, uh, government's not going to rebuild those houses at some point. We're not doing that forward thinking. We're just continuing to um, create a perverse incentive. Unintended consequences, so the survivor who's, um, return to their abusive home, they may not reach out for support the next time when the cycle of violence goes around and they've, they've been harmed again because they feel ashamed. Gosh, I didn't succeed in leaving. I can't ask them to help me again. Um, the other thing systems analysis can do is it can help you identify high leverage interventions because I don't know about you all, but we're overworked and under-resourced. And we need things that are going to give us a lot of bang for our buck. So we need those high leverage interventions that will address the root causes and make a difference over the long term for our community. They help us map the dynamics at play. Does anyone have a quick example of a perverse incentive or contributing to the problem that they can share with us? All right, I'll give you some more in a, in a second. So this, these are some wise words from Albert Einstein. The significant problems we face cannot be solved with the same level of thinking that created them. This is honestly our neighborhood. And this is a blue sky day. As you can see, it's not raining, right? It's not uncommon to see kids kayaking down the streets behind my house. That's right behind my house. And as I said, we all take pictures and think it's great and we post it at Facebook, but we're not doing the planning to figure out how we're going to either harden the shore or retreat from the sea. And so if your solution isn't working, more of the same isn't going to improve things. Not more programs, more events, more statistics in front of more groups. You have to look at what is holding the status quo in place. You have to ask who's benefiting in this system, who's contributing to it. The system isn't broken. It's actually doing exactly what it's designed to do. 
So as a wise woman once said, if nothing changes, nothing changes. And we have to do something differently. What we've chosen to do differently on our campus is implement the Green Dot Violence Prevention Strategy, which teaches bystander intervention and empowers a community to be a community of active bystanders. And we're gonna talk more about that. And so this is a four stage process. And we begin with the, the first stage. And this stage is all about building our foundation. Okay, and this is to engage our key stakeholders, all right? And this first stage is about building relational power, all right? And this stage is not about power over, okay? This is power with and power among, okay? We're disrupting the power structure or the hierarchy, okay? And this is power among, and we're building new creative solutions to emerge, all right? So Wendy just talked about the green dot, um, bystander intervention campaign. How many folks by show of hands are familiar with Green Dot? Oh wow. Okay great. Good. Okay so we don't have to back up and because we, we wanted to make sure we can talk about jargon and good. All right. So what we did is we began with a small committee of five and it was convened by our Dean of Students and it's important when you're starting any process that you begin with an administrator that's at at least the top level or as high as you can get to the top level because you have to have buy-in from the top um, because otherwise you're going to start something and then whoever's at the top is going to say well what are you doing right we know how that is so we had our, our dean of students and he's amazing and he started this process with us so we started with our group and we began with looking at who are going to be both our usual and our unusual allies and what we mean by that is we did not want this to be just the Women's Center program, okay? We didn't want it to be the Women's Center. We didn't want it to be just the Women's Studies. This could not be just based out of us. Um, we wanted to shift the culture of the campus, okay? So we're, we were changing the tides there. And we wanted to use an asset-based approach. And we wanted to build the strength of, by engaging both our athletes, our Greek life, our intramural sports teams, our faculty, you know, our fa you know, all across campus. And we wanted to mix with folks that were at every level, okay? So we wanted folks who worked with the students as, as well on our prevention team. So we looked at people who were in financial aid, our advising, our academic advisors, um, people who did conduct, um, people, again, who were in the athletic department. And what we ended up doing was pulling together a full relational network. These were folks who had relations all across campus, okay? And this was very imperative to build a strong foundation that way. So we were able to bust out of the silos by having that network. It is absolutely key. key. If you don't do that first step, none of the rest will ever work. Once you've figured out who the people are that you want on your team, implementing the change that you want to implement, you've got to face the current reality. You've got to deeply attend to the reality that people experience and they create together. And you do this by listening deeply. You go to people and you say, can I have 20 minutes of your time? I understand that you're someone who has a lot of history at this university or a really um, particular perspective on this problem, and I need some advice and some guidance from you. In my years of organizing, everyone I've ever asked to give me advice or guidance was willing to do it. People love to give advice and guidance, and it really, 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 really helps. And so, you know, if you just say 20 minutes of advice, you can usually get in the door. You sit, do sit down with them, and you share why sexual violence prevention matters to you, and you make it personal. But more importantly, you probe for their values and their dreams, and you ask why an awful lot, and you listen more than you talk. And you try to see the problem as they see it. For those of you who have a women's study or a social justice theory background, there's something called standpoint theory. So whenever you have a problem, different groups of people in a community will see that problem differently, right? Based on their perspective, their history, and their context. And if you want to solve that problem, you can't solve it from one perspective. You've got to have a coalition around the table, right? 
that deeply understands it from multiple perspectives to find a fundamental solution. So you've got to, in those meetings, you've got to get into the other person's space and see it the way they see it. You find their energy, their self-interest, and you offer them an alliance that will be useful to both of you. You want to figure out, how can I be useful to this person? So this is the systems analysis map that we developed once we got 33 people into the room to start implementing this campaign. We worked on it six months before we ever actually started doing it on campus. And I, the book I showed you helped me do this kind of mapping because I am not a, a systems engineer. That's not my background at all. But what it does is it shows you that there are like, I think there are like 12 common dynamics at play in any system that can get it mired in the status quo. And what we identified were the two um, stories, system stories, that were at play in our university s setting. First, we have the story of addiction. And this all centers around the quick fix. So there's a very um, social media uh, friendly um, incident that happens on campus that goes viral, right? And the leadership immediately wants you to come up with the program that's going to bring 900 athletes into the room and you're going to give them a one hour risk management session, right? And that's going to solve the problem. That's going to fix it, right? Or um, you're going to do a 20 minute orientation on the first weekend that students are on campus. And that's going to make sure that sexual violence doesn't happen after they're there for four more years. And that doesn't fix it either. But it shows numbers of programs, it shows attendance, which makes the trustees feel like in the Board of Visitors meeting that something is happening on campus. And it seems a lot less expensive than a four-year campus-wide campaign that's going to involve 30, 50 people working 10, 20% of their time. So the other dynamic at play was the vicious cycle, which I talked a little bit about removing um, survivors from their support networks um, and focusing on the victim over um, any focus on the perpetrator or the fundamental issues that uh, allow perpetration to happen on campus. Um, and that ends up reducing accountability because um, while we're all building shelters or making sure that the accommodations are there for the students, we're not looking at what's going on with the people who are committing these crimes on campus, and that's a real problem, and that creates a vicious cycle. The fundamental solutions we um, identified were shifting social norms to stigmatize predatory behavior on our campus, and we're making a lot of gains there. I'm really excited about that. We're also creating an environment where, um, because we work with very influential opinion leaders on campus, student opinion leaders, they feel like their groups have their back if they decide they're gonna step in and do something to distract someone or directly step in when they sense there might be danger or harm about to happen. So we're creating a bystander friendly environment on our campus. And then of course we need um, policy, we need resources, um, we need um, executive sponsorship for education programs that are going to empower students as leaders on our campus because as I talked about, equality is good for everyone and it reduces violence. So we gotta help people choose what they want. And in order to choose what you want, um, you've got to make this case for the status quo because it's usually more comfortable to stay where you are rather than to make a change. That's just human nature. It also usually costs a little more and takes a little more work than to just do what you've always been doing. So you've got to identify the case for the status quo. You've got to show um, how the short-term quick fix is not getting you where you want to go. And you have to accept that tr true change is gonna cost more, but you gotta make the case for why it's worth it. So you compare maintaining the status quo to the case for change. And you show the cost for not making the change. You make it very explicit. And this is how we pitched it to our leadership and we got the support. Um, which, you know, in the big realm of things, it's cost us about maybe $30,000 a year to run this program. but. On a university campus, asking for $30,000 takes some work. So um, what we needed to do was we needed to uh, look at why the status quo was um, 
hard? What were the challenges to changing the status quo? And they were our mental models. So we've always been doing awareness events. We've always been taking back the night and walking in their shoes, and that's how you solve the problem, right? We've got that, that's our model. But we had to say that wasn't actually doing the job. We've always been raising awareness. Um, we have always, it's always been the Women's Center alone that does this, so shouldn't the Women's Center continue to do this? Because this is a woman's issue, right? No, it affects everybody, we all know that. So you have to overcome those mental models. Um, you have to um, show folks that if we do this, we will be increasing retention and graduation rates and improving GPA, and that'll get, get us where we want to go. And that's how you get people to make the explicit choice that that is worth it, and we're going to do the change. All right, and so from there, what we're gonna do is to move to the next stage, which is the bridging the gap between what we want and where we are. And what we did was bid bystander intervention, which doesn't focus on the victim or make large parts of the community feel as if they are the problem. And what this means is that when you're engaging men, you don't want them to feel as if that we're saying that all men are rapists. We don't start from that vantage point because we recognize that given the opportunity, the majority of men will stand up and work with us in solving the problem. And that's where we start with. We let them know that, you know, like for our women's center, we actually have a program that's called Men Equality because we recognize that they want to work with us and that they're, they're part of the solution. Okay, so we have this, this particular group. So we work with Greeks and athletes and ROTC and student government, and these are the leadership networks and the opinion leaders that um, they are the key leverage points to shifting the campus culture. We recognize that research tells us that they're um, unlikely to, uh, the hardcore sex offenders that can shift um, the environment that we operate in. Um, so let me back up. What I recognize is that we need to use models that work, right? So, how many of us grew up when we were little, we had um, wore seat belts as a child in the car? Okay. Right? Just a few. When I was little, I didn't, all right? Those of you that raised your hand, it's because the laws had changed. My point is, I recognize that there's a model that's called the anti-drug violence movement, or drunk driving movement, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. The reason that you, those of you that raised your hand, that you now have a seat belt, is because of Mothers Against Drunk Driving, okay? When I was 10 years old, I was in a car accident. We were hit by a drunk driver. I'm standing before you because of a fluke, all right? I was sitting in the back seat, as I always had, I was playing, you know, riding, never thought about a seat belt. The car didn't even have seat belts. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a thing. That was what you called optional, you know, back then. So my parents you didn't paid even think about it. it, you know, because <laughs> optional meant you paid for it, right? Now you can't even buy a car without seat belts. They don't even make cars in the United States without seat belts, right? So I'm in the back seat playing minding my own business, my three-year-old brother's sitting in the front seat without a seat belt. We're driving along, we go through a green light as you usually do go through a green light, right? Drunk driver hits us broadside. Fortunately, we're in a sturdy, 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 tank-like uh, <laughs> car, uh, you know, because they don't make tank-like cars anymore now, but it was a station wagon. We flip going down the street. I fly through the front but fortunately, I'm too big to actually go through the window. I get hit by the back seat and fall through and hit the dashboard type of thing. My mother's fast enough to catch my smaller brother so he doesn't fly through the window type of thing. And we're all alive today. Now, how many of you, if you saw my mother right now driving with my three-year-old brother sitting in the front seat without a seat belt would be on your phone if you're at the stoplight. 911, I can't believe that this woman is driving in this car without this child in it. You, you call somebody. If not the police, you call your friend, like, I can't believe she's driving with this car. Blah, 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 blah. Or take a picture or whatever, right? And you would feel that it was your right to do so, right? That's a generational thing. 
you know, that's Mothers Against Drunk Driving because there were enough mothers who were mad at drunk drivers. My mother after that point was mad. I mean, my, my mother, y'all don't know my mother. <laughs> my mother was a five foot one, red haired, burning Texas woman, proud, longhorn, got out the car, hot at this woman because she had hit her child or her children and so forth, drunk driving, you know, and so forth. She was upset because how dare she hit us, you know, running the red light. Mothers Against Drunk Driving changed this country, got legislation because enough people, enough children died to the point of where we all know that we can't drive with children without seat belts. And to the point, can't drive drunk. and people can't drive drunk. <laughs> Two things happen within one generation. Children can't ride without seat belts. People can't drive drunk. Because right now, how many of us will stop somebody from our house? Like if they're drunk, we won't let them drive home, right? We feel it's our right to do so. We feel it's our responsibility. Like, no, if they're our friend, or even if we don't like them, <laughs> right? We will stop them because it's our responsibility. Why won't we stop somebody if we think that they're going to sexually assault somebody? Right? We got to shift the generation. We'll get to that point. I truly believe if done, a systems approach can, in a generation, change just like that. If we operate it just like that, we get mad enough, just like Mothers Against Drunk Driving, to systemically, collectively work together like that to make a difference. If we invite, inspire, and engage people in a positive way, because Mothers Against Junk Driving put it that way, it said, like, collectively, this is our responsibility to do it. It is possible, okay? I want to show you a video that we did that's an example of how we can collectively work together. This helped bridge the gap on our campus and inspire people that it was possible. Yeah. With one of our unusual allies. Bobby Wilder, head football coach of the Old Dominion University Monarchs. It's time to put sexual and relationship violence on the sidelines. I expect every monarch to do something, big or small, to keep our campus and community safe. Together, as a team, we can prevent violence one green dot at a time. So we played that at the homecoming game. Thank you. Then we switched in the basketball coaches and we played it at the basketball games. Mm, that's it. <laughs> and I'm going to do it again this We're year. We're going to do it again this year. That's it. <laughs> Just like the Mothers Against Drug Driving, I'm going to get out there. Friends don't let friends dri drive drunk, and we as a community watch out for other, each other. Monarchs make a difference. That's okay. our message. <laughs> so how did we do it? We're going to talk about how we did it. And part of how we did it was to figure out how do we do it? We used a power mapping exercise. 
So what we're gonna ask you to do is, is to do this. We implemented the green dot thing exercise for success and we're gonna walk you through this in an abbreviated version of it um, so you can get a sense of it. And we want you to figure out what the connections are and the relationships are for your own campus so that you can disrupt the, the complex problems that, that you may have, whether it's on your own campus or in your own community, okay? The first thing that we're gonna do is identify the leaders or super nodes, you know, as you, as you look at this particular um, power map there, you see the, the middle things are, are super nodes there um, that we're gonna illustrate and how to, to move the person to alignment to a shared vision. So how many of you came to this particular workshop with somebody that you work with or not? Okay, Great. so if you did, you can pair up with that person or not, it's up to you. Um, but for this particular exercise, we are gonna ask you to pair up with somebody to, to possibly work through it. Um, so take a moment to just pair up with, with somebody because it's, it's a little easier to pair up with it. So you can at least talk through it with somebody. So get in the pairs or maybe in, um, you know, three folks so you can talk through it. Thank you. So all systems change is about diffusion of the innovation, right? It's about finding who are the super nodes, the key opinion leaders, influencers, and they may not always be the president, they may be Miss Rudy, or they may be the grounds crew or the librarians. Who are those people? And if you get them modeling the behavior, reinforcing the messaging, then you start to diffuse through the community mm -hmm. what the change that you wanna see. So you don't have to get to everybody. That's the beauty of, of an organizing strategy. You just have to get to the right people. You gotta figure out who they are, and power mapping helps you do that. Exactly, and, and speaking of which, we actually have um, some handouts that we have up front if you want um, specific directions on, on how to do power mapping through another other couple of ways to do it. So we, we have them up front here if you wanna pick them up um, at the end. And so. this is a little, goes into more depth than we could do in this room today, so check it out. Yeah, so we have them up front. Okay. So, um, once you've done your power map, you want these people on board, but they're not going to be your worker bees, right? They're right. going to be the people, they're the rainmakers, they're going to bless what you're doing and make the way, and make it possible for the folks who are doing the work to take time away from their jobs. Because systems change takes time. And so you need their support in order for those people to be working with you on changing the culture on your campus or in your community. So what you need to do is you go, need to go out and do an individual with the individual meeting with these folks as well. And we brought our president, John, into the room with you today. He has a nice bow tie and a big heart. heart. So we know he's gonna support us. Mm -hmm. And we also know mm -hmm. that until the president really, really embraces our strategy, nothing is going to happen on our campus. So we're gonna go into this individual meeting with, with our president, but actually I can't get the individual meeting, even though I'm leading the Green Dot effort. So we're gonna go back to our Dean of Students because he was a student in the president's class and obviously a dean of students is at his l level where he can pick up the phone and ask for a meeting with the president. And so I have a conversation with the dean of students. I say we really need to have a direct conversation with the president before we launch this strategy on campus. And he goes in and he meets with the president, not trying to sell him on Green Dot. That is absolutely not what he is trying to do in that meeting. What he's trying to do is to probe and learn and listen to what makes the president tick. What drives him, what gives him energy? What does he get up and put on the top of his to-do list every day? When you understand that, you can figure out how to be useful to that person. And you can draw their stick figure afterwards, um, which are what are the five or six things that matter most to John? Well, obviously the General Assembly, after I've had this you know, really listening conversation with him, I know he's thinking a lot about the General Assembly. They provide 60% of our funding on a public university. The governor appoints, appoints the Board of Visitors and they supervise him. So anything that the Board of Visitors is interested in, I know John's interested in that as well. The donors, the donors make up the difference between that 60 and 100%. So anything that the donors enjoy, 
our president is going to want to support. Mm -hmm. And they love athletics. They love them some football. So <laughs> I definitely know that anything that we're doing with the athletic teams is also going to be very important to the president. He cares about his family. He has a wife and children. And in a couple of years, he's made it clear that he's probably going to be moving on to his next um, professional adventure in life. So he's thinking about his legacy, and that's really important. So um, I could be useful to him. The Green Dot strategy could be useful to him, more importantly, in providing a, leg a legacy where he is leaving this campus safer, more violence-free than when he arrived as the president of our university. Um, and that's a pretty compelling thing for him to want to do or for us to offer to do together. So our conversations, we could spend 90 minutes pairing you up and having you practice individual meetings, but we're not going to do that. But our conversation, <laughs> go do it yourself, though. Next okay. time you, you want to make right. something happen, have a person-centered, not a task-centered conversation with somebody. Make sure it's relational and focused on the long-term aspirations of the other person. You're looking for the energy that drives them every day, what really matters to them. And remember, this is the most important thing if you're going to be an organizer in your community. You always end the meeting with an ask or a next step. And if you don't have a direct ask, you at least ask, who else should I meet with to understand this problem better? So you're constantly building and expanding your network. You never stop building on what you're doing. There we go. All right. And so the biggest challenge you know, facing our social change agents is how to support people in realizing that their highest aspirations, you know, particularly that these diverge from their most immediate concerns and their everyday lives. So like Wendy was talking about, we're talking about the president. What is, what's, what's his biggest concern? He's thinking about the university, thinking about the board of trustees, all of those types of things. We need, to, we need to think about all of those types of things. What we have to remember is that we hurt ourselves when we fail to recognize our interconnectedness, okay? So we're, we're thinking about all of the things that we've learned over this last couple of days. You know, we're thinking about, you know, all of the intergenerational things. We're thinking about all the isms that we're thinking about. We're thinking about sexism and, and sexual assault and domestic violence and all of those types of things systems thinking and organizations that the work that we're doing, we're helping people to remember that our futures are intertwined, okay? This picture here is a great picture that we use. Um, this is our Interfraternity Council. They are our unusual allies. We were psyched to get so many folks, some of those young men to come out. They support us all the time. You know, they are some of our biggest allies. Remember when I talked about when I first came on, I helped uh, folks to understand that yes, we are the Women's Center, but we love working with men. This is why we, we, we let them know this. You know, they are our allies. This is how they come out. They come out to walk a mile in our shoes. They come out to take back the night. They come out to things and they, they are here and they support us with Green Dot. So this is what we help them to remember that they are interconnected with us. They can help us to end sexual assault because they are um, you know, part of the work that we do. They're the solution. They are the solution. You know, when they talk about ending sexual violence, people will listen to them. Mm -hmm. You know, not, not just us talking about it. Remember when we talked about it, it's not a women's issue, it's an everyone's issue. You know, that type of thing. So, what we hope is that we've offered you some ideas and we offered you some tools, okay, that can begin to, to reweave the fabric of, of our community so that our children and our community can have the opportunity to reach our full potential, which is free of violence, you know, both for our schools and our neighborhoods and our campuses and our collective communities together. Thank you so Thank much you for so spending much. part of your day with us. Thank you for listening to this Prevent Connect podcast. Prevent Connect is a project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault with funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views presented on Prevent Connect are not necessarily the views of the United States government, the CDC, or CalCASA. To learn more about Prevent Connect, visit www.preventconnect.org. For more information about CalCASA's mission or to show your support, visit calcasa.org.
That's C-A-L-C-A-S-A dot O-R-G.